Hey everybody, it's Jonah Lupton back again with another episode of Startup Sense. I hope you're all having a great day. Uh, we got another great show for you. Uh, I'm excited to introduce Joe Waltman, the founder, actually co-founder of Vet Pronto. Joe, how are you? Doing well, doing well. Good talking. Thanks, man. Um, before we start talking about your company and what you guys are up to, you just want to tell us a little bit about yourself first? Yeah. I've got a uh, engineering background. Uh, finished college way too long ago, almost two decades ago. Started out doing engineering stuff at big companies like Qualcomm and Akamai. More recently, I've been doing the um, entrepreneurial thing. Uh, started a email marketing company about seven or eight years ago that we sold to Twitter in 2012. Shortly thereafter, then linked back up with my co-founder Soren. We met up with Catherine, who's our third co-founder. She's a veterinarian, and we launched Vet Pronto uh, a couple of years ago. And Vet Pronto does vet house calls. Awesome. Um, so I can't can't jump across this topic. Uh, you sold the company to Twitter. Um, how did that go down? And did you guys end up with some stock in the company? It was a pretty typical talent acquisition. Uh, say, uh, I, I like to say that uh, since I don't possess any talent, I wasn't part of the deal. Uh, everybody else in the company, though, went went over to Twitter. Um, so it wasn't wasn't a lifestyle changing thing. It was a very interesting <laughs> uh, process to go through. Uh, but uh, but but uh, yeah, that's that's uh, the, the pretty typical talent acquisition. Okay. Yeah, ac- acqui hire, I guess, as they call it. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. So you jumped in. So the next project after that was Vet Pronto. Exactly. Yeah, which we're okay. currently working. So tell us about Vet Pronto. What you guys do and. You know, how the founders all got together when you actually started working on this. So Soren and I worked on on the email marketing company Rest Engine together. We've known each other for eight years. Uh, Catherine, we met through a actually a former co-founder uh, who um, who's no longer with the company. The the idea is pretty simple. Send a veterinarian to you instead of you dragging your uh, your dog or cat to the vet hospital, which if you have a dog or cat, you know that's usually less than fun experience. Miserable um, experience. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, the concept's pretty easy to grasp from a customer perspective or a client perspective. Um, actually, implementing a distributed healthcare system is non-trivial. Uh, there's there's a lot of industrial logic why hospitals have physical locations where all the people, all Joe, the supplies, all the medications. Uh, you're just you're sorry. Just breaking, yeah, you're breaking oh, gosh, up. I'm sorry about that. Is that oh, your connection? Sorry, yeah, well, so hopefully, hopefully it's not the connection. Um, so there, what I was saying is that it's um, it's it's not easy setting up a distributed health system. Uh, we we've got to make sure we get all we get the right people, the right medications, the right supplies to the right place at the right time. Um, it's uh, it's it makes a lot of sense having all that in a hospital where clients come to you, where you can you can be dare I say a little bit lazy uh, in terms of of setting appointments up and getting all the necessary information. We've uh, we can't be that lazy. We really have to have to get a lot of information up front, make sure all of our people, all of our, all of our inventory is well coordinated, and then get all that stuff distributed around um, appropriately. So we we've, we've learned it's it's a lot of it is is a logistics business. Right. Um, getting this thing this thing up and running. We built a um, it's it's not done and it's not perfect, but it's a pretty slick platform that uh, that allows us to do this at scale. And we we recently expanded to a number of other cities. Um, because we, we feel like we've gotten the platform to a place where, where we can uh, roll it out to other markets. Now, you started in San Francisco, right? Yep. What was the, how long were you just in San Francisco? And then how long before you expanded into other cities? And what was the second city that you added? We, we did a couple tests uh, a year or two ago that, that didn't go that well for various reasons. So realistically, we've been in just San Francisco or just the Bay Area for almost two years getting the model just right from an operations and a marketing perspective. And just in the last month or two, we launched in, in six or seven new cities. Okay. So it, it really hasn't. And that's, we, we've heard from other on-demand services. That's pretty common. Uh, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of devils in the details with getting this stuff, getting this stuff going. And it takes a while to really, uh, to really get it cranking. And I wouldn't claim that we're perfect or that we've got it all figured out, but we think we're, we're at a place where we can, we can at least start experimenting in other cities. So on the website, I think I saw seven or eight cities listed, you know, most of the big cities that you can imagine, New York and L.A., and I think Chicago was in there, and of course, San Fran. Um, when you go into a new city, what's the bigger challenge, finding the veterinarians or finding the customers? Both, 
both. Um, we're, we think we're a pretty attractive option for veterinarians. So we haven't had a huge challenge getting, getting vets. Um, the, the client acquisition side is definitely challenging. The vast majority of pet owners, like over 90%, don't even know that house calls are an option. So they're of definitely course. not looking for them. Uh, right. we, we need to, and, and it's a fairly infrequent behavior. So if we spend any money getting our message in front of somebody who doesn't need the vet, that money's probably wasted. So we really need to get good at the intent-based channels like Google and Yelp and hopefully concisely and, and effectively not only tell them about the existence of house calls, but also explain the value props and get them to at least give it a consideration. And that's, that's asking a lot in the however many characters a Google AdWords ad gives you. So talk to me about what a typical veterinarian practice looks like and why this is a you know, an attractive option or feature for them. Um, you know, how many people in a typical veterinarian practice, you know, do they do house calls or is this a completely new concept? Um, and then are they usually just sitting around for two or three hours a day where they have some time to do house calls? Yeah. So this, this is definitely not a new concept. House calls were actually how vet care started back in the, in the, in the good old days when we all lived on farms, your, your vet would come to you okay, to deal right. with your, your, your domestic yeah, your your, and your right, livestock. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is now, and with as we've become more urbanized, uh, the the vet have mo- the vets have moved into clinics, and, and it makes a lot of sense. You you can you can see a lot more appointments per hour and, and patients per hour if you're doing them in a clinic and they come to you. Um, the vets that that we work with generally, or none of them have their own clinic. They're all what's called associates or employees at existing clinics, and some of them only work with us. Others will have a day job at a clinic and work with us either after their shifts or on, on days off to earn extra income. Um, and, uh, and we're a very different kind of, of job option for, for those vets, whereas they're in a clinic, they're probably putting in 10 to 12 hour days. They're probably seeing 30 to 40 patients a day. With us, they can work as much as they want to if it's only a few hours or a full day, and they're seeing generally about one patient per day. So it's a very different kind of experience for the vets. Uh, you okay. spend a lot more time with the patient, you really get to know the client, we feel like you can you can practice much higher quality medicine. Now, is there a worry that some of those vets may go around your system at some point once they develop a relationship with the customer? Or is it too risky for them? Because if that gets out, you know, if you find out, you know, you're removing from the platform and they've just lost their gravy train. Yeah, a couple of them already have. And I think that's that's a natural challenge of any of these these systems. Now, I think the best way to, to, to prevent that is just provide an amazing service for both sides so that they couldn't imagine working without us. Um, and there are some regulatory challenges if you're going to start your own vet clinic. One good example is if you, if you see a patient, uh, you need to make, have those records, those patients' records available and be able to transmit them to other vet clinics for three years after, after that appointment. Um, and that's, a, that's kind of a daunting uh, request to ask for somebody who's maybe just starting out and not sure if they really want to do this. So that by itself is a pretty big uh, hurdle for, for, um, for vets to, to clear. And if, if they don't make the, vets, the, the records available, they can potentially lose their license. Um, do you so guys, okay. th- those so you are guys the sorts have... of things that, w- that we do for them, yeah. Okay, so you've created a platform with a lot of the back office stuff to help them out. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. We've talked okay. to a lot of other vets that are doing house calls on their own, and they spend up to 50% of their time doing non-medical stuff like marketing and billing and follow-ups, all the things that our platform take care of for the vets. And I'm sure that's all the stuff they don't like, and you know, they don't like doing. They didn't get into the business to be a vet, to do a lot of that operational stuff. Generally speaking, yeah. So what types of services can they do in the home? You know, I'm sure, you know, this, they're probably a little bit more limited, right? Than the services definitely, they could offer definitely. in the clinic. Yeah, you can do basically anything that doesn't require sedation. Uh, it's, although some vets do it, but not on our platform, it is, it is irresponsible to sedate outside of the clinic, and, and, and we do not advocate that at all. Um, so uh, if you've been to a vet clinic, the, the way to think about it is anything that they can do in the examination room with you, we can do at home. But when they take your animal into the back, usually they're doing something that, that involves sedation, and that's something that we can't do at home. And we've, we have relationships with, with a lot of existing vet clinics where – uh, if, if, if the, if something more invasive is needed, we can, we can refer to an existing vet clinic. Sometimes we even provide a taxi service where we'll take them to the clinic for the, uh, I mean, I would client. certainly think that 
you know, the, these pets in general are probably more relaxed at home than they would be going to a clinic, right? I mean, so it's easier to give a pet a yeah. shot in their own house than it is on a, on a table you know, in some sterile room. Yeah, we, we've, and that, that's one of kind of the feel-good parts of running this business is I can't tell you how many clients we've, we've had that said, you know, my cat has not seen the vet for X years because it just completely freaks out. And, and now my cat or, or dog can actually receive proper health care. Like you've, you've really changed my cat and my life as, as a result. Um, oftentimes when pets that get stressed out by going to the, to the clinic, the, the, the health damage done by the stress is worse than what they went in there for in the first place. <laughs> All right. This is Jonah Lupton, founder of the Lupton Group and host of the Startup Sense podcast. Are you struggling to find the right tech team to build your company's website or mobile app? Maybe you've developed a product but need help with your go-to-market strategy, including branding and marketing. Well, stop worrying because my team at the Lupton Group can assist you with all of those needs. We specialize in helping entrepreneurs and startups of all sizes launch and grow their businesses. For a free consultation, you can email me at jonahlupton at gmail.com or visit our website at luptongroup.co. Um, so talk about the business then. So when did you guys, so you, you started working on this in 2014, right? We started working on a vet care idea broadly in 2014. We, we were operating under the flawed thesis that there are a lot of smart people and smart money going after human health tech. Why don't we look at some of those models and try to apply them to, to vet or to, to animal health tech? So the first thing we did, like a number of other companies uh, since have done, is started out with a video chat service with a vet. So kind of like doctor on demand, but for veterinarians. For various reasons, that that didn't work, primarily being dogs and cats aren't very good at telling you what's wrong with them, so you need to be with them physically to examine them. We then moved to or pivoted to a an asynchronous Q&A service, uh, kind of like Health Tap, but for veterinarians. For different reasons, that didn't work very well. In the process of building out these two services, we talked to over 100 pet owners asking typical customer development questions, things like, what sucks about owning a pet? And the almost unanimous first or second answer to that question was going to the veterinarian. Right. That basically presented us with a pretty obvious idea of, well, what if we built an on-demand service that's on par with some of the other on-demand services we're getting spoiled by now these days, like Uber and Postmates and Instacart? Um, and that was about two years ago we launched that, and it, it, uh, it quickly became obvious that it was going to work. So we've, uh, we've since been focused on that and have really – um, and, you know, we're quite happy with how it's going. Terrific. Sounds like a nice niche. Uh, when did you guys start to raise money? Uh, we, so we launched in September of 14. Shortly thereafter, we applied to Y Combinator for their winter 15 class. So the batch that was, or their winter 15 batch, the batch was starting a few months after we launched and we were fortunate enough to get in. So that was really our first fundraising from, from YC and, and on the back of, of getting into YC, we had some friends and family uh, pitched some money into, um, and then and then we continuously raised after YC. You know, typically, you, you raise on demo day. We candidly, we really struggled with with traditional uh, investors. Uh, this is for for whatever reason. We, we've heard a bunch of reasons, but for whatever reason, we we've, we've been unable to get a a major investor to uh, to to step up and and do something formally. Um, so we've really had to rely on on the different crowdfunding platforms. I think we've basically used all of them. Or that I'm aware of, at least to date, to, uh, to to raise funds. Why do you think uh, you know a big, you know, traditional, you know, VC investor hasn't jumped on this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's it's either we're a mediocre team, which is very which is very likely. Uh, what, if I want to feel a little bit better about myself, I say, uh, well, you know, this is kind of still a weird space for a yeah, lot of right. investors. Uh, although <laughs> although it's big yeah. that. Yeah, the, the 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 pet, the just the pet market broadly is a sixty billion dollar market in the U.S. alone. Veterinary services are seventeen to twenty billion, so that's wow. definitely not small. But uh, it still feels if if you're if you're an investor and you're investing in you know much much bigger categories, it might feel small. Also, if you don't own a pet, you probably don't understand the the value <laughs> proposition. You know how miserable it is, and and we we haven't done the scientific study, but only like. 10 or 15 percent of investors we've talked to have actually owned a pet which oh, wow. you know versus 56 percent which is the national average 
And That's crazy. you may be able to draw some conclusions about investors from that. I, I don't want to, I don't want to go there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we just, for whatever reason, not very many investors have pets, so they probably don't understand our core value prop. I mean, I think there's almost as many dogs and cats in the U S as there are humans, right? Yeah, more, definitely more so than, than, uh, than children. Uh, there are, there, there are fewer dogs and cats. Well, th- these numbers are really hard to get, but I, I think there are fewer, um, domesticated dogs and cats who, you know, who have, who have nice loving homes and there are humans, but right. there are definitely more than there are, you know, children under the age of 18. Right. right. I mean, I know there is what, 300 and something million Americans. I think there's at least 200 million dogs and cats, right? Is it that big? Or maybe my numbers are off. I think it's a little bit less than that. And okay. again, th- these are really hard numbers to get there. Yeah. There's, while there's amazing data on human health care and all of the variables around it, it's really hard to get, to get uh, good data on, on just pets broadly, especially pet right. care. You know, the, the crazy cat lady that has 17 cats. I mean, they're probably not all registered and no one knows about them. So there's no way to account for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of, okay, so crowdfunding. Um, some people are familiar with crowdfunding because, you know, we all know Kickstarter and Indiegogo. But there's also equity crowdfunding nowadays. And that's what you guys did, right? So we started out, uh, we did an angel list syndicate. This is before the equity thing. You know, that, that's only a few months okay. old of the chain of the, the reduced uh, barrier or the reduced rules for accreditation. Uh, we, did, we did an angel list round. We did a funders club round. We even did a one vest round. I'm not sure if they're even still in existence anymore. And then more recently, we did a we funder round. And, the we fund, and, and those, prior to we funder, those were all with, with quote unquote accredited investors with a minimum investment of, I think, uh, 1,000, or in some cases, 10,000 um, dollars. Now, the the the, equi- the true equity crowdfunding, what I would call it, is is the is this new uh, thing that that basically reduced the hurdle for an, for accreditation. I think now almost anybody, or maybe maybe it is anybody, can invest, and in. you can invest as little as 100 dollars per person. Um, and that's I, I find that fascinating, and and half the reason why I mean, while money's great, and, it's, and we definitely need it to keep the business going, I was also really curious to see what would happen with one of these new, I think they're called uh, Reg C uh, rounds. And um, I was very, very pleasantly surprised. We, we were um, shooting for 50 to 100K. We ended up raising 370K. Wow. Through, on we, through that's we, on WeFunder? We wow. On just WeFunder, yeah. Yeah, and I think that speaks to a lot. There, it's probably not appropriate for all businesses. We happen to be a high affinity business. If people really love their pets, and they really love people who, you know, who, who literally save the lives of their pets. Which in some cases we do, no, not not always, but in some and cases. This is a consumer service, right? So when you're going to raise money from exactly. non-accredited people, that's a consumer. You know, the consumer they get this because, like you said, I mean, half of those people probably have pets. They've dragged their pet to the veterinarian. They know how much of a pain in the butt it is. So here you go out. You know, you're solving one of their biggest problems, and people want to put money into you know solutions that fix their own problems. Yeah, indeed. If you look at some of the some of the, the companies that are raising on on these on these um, platforms, they all have kind of that in common. You know, they're like a, a brewery or a right. movie studio or, yeah, or things like that. I, I'd right. be surprised if like it, products, uh, you know, it, connected devices, yeah. you know, IoT stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Right. You don't see too many like enterprise, you know, analytics companies on these crowdfunding, you know, the equity crowdfunding platforms because the consumers just don't understand what those companies do. Yeah, they might have more of a challenge. Right. Um, so 370000 Wow, that's impressive. Um, so how are you guys planning on spending that money? And does that get you, you know, another year or 18 months? Um, when, we, when will you guys have to raise money again, you think? Yeah, that'll get us 18 to 24 months. Okay. Uh, awesome. we're, we're, we're pretty close to assuming nothing changes, which is probably a dangerous assumption because we're, we're growing nicely and we should be profitable by early next year. Which means it'll it'll you know then we can start thinking about some really interesting investments to make with with that money or maybe just hold it around to to for a rainy day. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's uh it was we didn't necessarily need it, but it's it's really nice to have and and now we can you know, sleep a little bit better at night knowing that we're not um you know too close to the uh, to our our, our death bed. So what is the you know your month over month growth rate right now, and then you know what marketing channels are really uh, driving that growth. So we've been growing by about fifteen percent a month. Okay. Uh, almost uh, over over you know over a hundred percent per per year. Well over a hundred percent per year. But a, um, a lot of that was like just said, though, right now that you guys are in multiple cities, those numbers could probably 
um, accelerate even more? Yeah, it, it'll. Well, yeah, and, and we need to obviously be honest about about in city versus nationwide growth and, and look at each, which which of course we do uh, behind the scenes. But yeah, a new market grows really fast, and then it you know start. I don't want to say San Francisco is is mature, but we're not growing as quickly in SF city as we were in early days, obviously. Um, on the marketing side, the the intent based channels really work best. So AdWords is big, Yelp is big. Um, people generally, if they're looking for a vet, they don't go to Facebook or Twitter to look for a right. vet. They, they don't right. go to the they don't go to the app store to look for a vet, as you would imagine. Mm-hmm. Although we we have a mobile app, and and that's that's an important reactivation uh, retention tool. It's not it's not important on the activation side. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. it's ba- basically Google and, and Yelp, and and I should also mention to a lesser extent uh, Nextdoor, but Nextdoor is becoming more important. How many you know Google searches a month are there for terms like you know veterinarian to my house or veterinarian on demand? So very, I don't know. And unfortunately, Google doesn't make that data all that accessible anymore. Maybe we don't subscribe to the right um, services. But the the, the relative uh, searches of just generic vet versus vet house call are are dwarfed. Uh, like I said, very few people even know that house calls are an option, and they're definitely not searching for them very often. Uh, so we need to go after and aggressively bid on the generic vet terms and then use that ad and, and hopefully that, that, that few seconds of attention to educate those pet owners to the, the option of a house call and hopefully get them to even consider it. So what types of partnerships? I mean, like, are there large, there's got to be large blogs, right, that pet owners subscribe to because there's just a lot of good information about keeping their pets healthy and, you know, the best dog food or whatever it might be. Are there blog bloggers that you guys can partner up with or other partnerships that yeah. you know, may make growth that may, may make sense for growth? It, it, it actually good question. When we were only in, in one market, it didn't really make sense. I mean, those, those bloggers are expensive. They, they know what they've got and they, they don't, they don't give their audience away for free. They're good at monetizing. So, so with, yeah, everyone we talked to wanted thousands of dollars to, wow. to get a post. And, and when we were in just one city, that did make sense. Now that we're in seven or eight cities, it, it actually might make sense. To, and, and, of course, the bloggers have a nationwide or worldwide audience, so right. we couldn't target on just you know just the market where we offer services. But those sorts of things will probably become – we'll at least experiment with them as, as, we're, as we're now in more markets. And you actually, you just – I'm, I'm going to add something to my to-do list to start looking at those sorts of, of, of options. Right. Now, like you said, right now that you guys are more of a national company, uh, you know, those blogger audiences, I mean, they're all over the place. So, I mean, spending a few thousand dollars, but at least, you know, it's, you know, it's a quality audience, you know, it's. Yeah. Um, what is the business model exactly? I mean, I'm sh- assuming you guys are taking a percentage of every home visit. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pr- pretty typical on demand model where we, we provide the platform. We, uh, we, provide a number of other services for the vet. We bill the client and then we, we pay the vet either a flat fee for, for the appointment or they're on a salary and they're, they're getting a flat fee each month. They, they, just, they just make themselves available for X number of appointments per month. Okay. Which, which model do you think is going to make more sense in the future? Or will it be kind of, you know, you'll have both options for the veterinarians. They can either have a salary or they can, you know, kind of pay to play. Yeah, the, the, and we think that's going to be the, the model. That let the vets decide. Uh, the vets that are on salary tend to uh, prefer the predictability of the income. Uh, the vets that are on contract tend to prefer the flexibility of just telling us when they're when they're available, and we hopefully fill up their schedule. Right. I mean, and, and once you've been in the city long enough, where you know there's a lot of you know demand, you know, then then you can. It makes more sense to probably shift people onto salary if that's you know if that's the direction they want to go. So, for instance, let's take San Francisco because you guys have been in San Fran the longest. How many vets do you have on your platform serving the San Francisco or Bay Area? We've got 14 or 15 vets in just San Francisco. Wow. Okay. Three or four of those are on salary, and the rest are contractors. Okay. We've got about 35 vets nationwide. Right now, most of them are in the Bay Area right now. In the new cities that we've recently launched, we generally have just one vet in each of those cities. I mean, like a city like New York, right? New York, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but it's got to be, what, it's at least 12 million people, right, in, in the New York City area. I mean, it's just enormous. Yeah, I, mean, it, it, I don't know either, but it's, it's massive. It's like, it, it's, all, I think Manhattan alone has, has multiple, well, I, I, I got the numbers somewhere from my computer. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but yeah, it's like 
it's probably TEDx in size in San Francisco. And I would see that, I mean, you know, if I lived in a building in New York, a nice luxury building, and I got this service and I liked it, you know, I would certainly tell my neighbors, you know, if I, if I knew they were pet owners as well, you know, this is a nice on-demand service that everyone should know about. So I would think that that's one, you know, that's one way you'll start to scale is, you know, word of mouth, referrals. Um, do you have any built-in programs to kind of handle referrals and, you know, reward people for, you know, bringing you new business? We, yeah, we, agreed. Uh, word of mouth is probably our number one channel, although it's it's oftentimes very difficult to to, to track and attribute back to word of mouth. Uh, we've experimented with referral programs. Nothing's really panned out, and I'm not sure I have a good explanation why. Um, I feel I, I heard a story from a YC partner once where they were apparently they had a they had a bunch of, of of marketing people from different startups, and one they were asking them all questions going around the room, and one question they so, you know, what, what is the, the tactic or, or the channel that you had the highest expectations for that didn't work? And almost all of them answered referral campaigns. And, and the general consensus was that referrals only really worked for like two or three companies. And we've all heard that story, you know, the Uber right. story and the Blue Apron <laughs> story and, you know, yeah. maybe one or two more. But everybody else tries and it was everybody else fails at it. I can see where it's hard because it's not like people take their pets to the vet on a weekly basis. So it's not like... You know, when I go out and have drinks with my buddies, we're talking about, you know, vet visits for our pets. Um, and then the other thing, you know, like I see people post up on Facebook saying, you know, please pray for my dog. I just took him to the vet. So it's like most of the stuff you see pet related that goes on to Facebook is kind of after, you know, after they've taken their pet to the vet and they've gotten this, you know, bad diagnosis and they're all asking for prayers. You know, where they don't really they don't really post post anything on Facebook in, um, you know, in preparation of that visit, I guess. So it's kind of hard for you know, for me to message Joe and be like, Hey, before you take your pet to the vet, you know, go to vet pronto. I mean, just, so that's, yeah. I can see where that's tricky. We've talked to some pretty smart people who do, who like set up referral uh, systems and platforms for other companies. And, and they're, they've echoed that, but you know, your service healthcare isn't an inherently social service. So it, it probably doesn't make sense to, to invest a bunch of time and energy and in trying to figure out the referral uh, you know, the, the, how to unlock that, 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 that thing. Cause it, there may not be a way to do it. So talk to us about um, the, I want to go back to the equity crowdfunding for a second. So you raise money on WeFunder. What kinds of um, like requirements do you have as the company to communicate with, you know, this new pool of investors? I, I think we, there are some SEC requirements. Um, one of the benefits of WeFunder is they navigate a lot of that for us. We have to yeah. do certain filings. Um, they, they do a lot of it for us. I don't think there are any specific you know, monthly or quarterly uh, requirements. We will be updating them on a monthly basis. That's just the standard uh, approach we've taken with all of our investors to date. I send monthly updates that you know, talk about the revenue and appointments and challenges and accomplishments. I, I think it's, it's really helpful. Uh, for to stay top of mind to investors, you know, for for example, we're we're just launching a few in a few um, new markets, and we've got a couple hundred investors now. So I I will definitely be hitting them up soon, saying, hey, if you know anybody in these markets with a pet, or if you live in these markets with a pet, please give us some love. Um, and and I think the more top of mind you are to to your investors, and now we're probably approaching a thousand investors with it with a WeFunder campaign. Um, these people can really be not just sources of money, but but advocates for you and you know helping you get more clients or partners or whatever is that we funder campaign still open it just closed a week or two ago damn <laughs> i was gonna i wanted to put some money in <laughs> not because i like it and i think you're right i think i think you touched on you know what i really think is the most valuable part of the equity crowdfunding from non-accredited investors is that now you have this pool of hundreds or even thousands of people that have essentially bought into your company they now own a, a little sliver and now they're kind of like your marketing team on the ground. Indeed, indeed. You know, and especially when you're trying to get into new cities and you have these people kind of spread around the country, you never, you know, you don't know who they know. Can they get you into XYZ building, you know, a luxury building? And this is like a, an ancillary service that the front desk is able to offer. So, yeah, hopefully some cool things come out of that then. Um, trying to think what I I want to ask you now. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about kind of the the challenges of starting this company. I know you said in the beginning it's it really is like a logistics company. Has that been the you know the number one challenge over the last couple of years? So the, 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 that's definitely been difficult, but the customer acquisition has definitely been the biggest challenge. 
uh, try, trying to, to make pet owners aware, in a cost-effective manner, make pet owners aware of our existence. Um, that, that is certainly the, the hardest thing, and we've been demand-constrained uh, primarily. Uh, Do you have we think these, oh, go ahead. these logistical problems and these operational problems, are, are, those are solvable problems. Uh, there, people have done this before. Uh, it's, it's not impossible, but the, the, the client side is, is a behavior change problem, and that's tough. People, most of our clients have never done a house call before, so we're asking them to do something new, and that's, that's always challenging. Right. They haven't done, done it themselves or their pets. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Are there any other companies out there right now that are doing kind of mobile veterinarians? So there are mobile vets in every market in, in the U.S., probably the world. It's actually the way veterinarians started practicing medicine. Um, they are usually one-person shows or where it's the doctor not only doing the appointments but also doing all the marketing, all of the billing, all of the scheduling. Uh, you can imagine how quickly they hit their, their capacity ceiling with that. And we've talked to a lot of these house call vets. Some of them are now working for us or with us. And, um, and they spend up to half of their time just doing administrative crap when, you know, they're a doctor. They went to school for a whole bunch of time. They should be using their time a lot more efficiently. Um, so that, that, that's one of the, the promises of our platform, that we take a lot of this administrative crap off their plates, let them focus on just doing the magic that is veterinary care, and let us figure out how to get a new client, schedule their, their day, bill their clients, blah, blah, blah. Um, there are two or three other companies that are, I'm not sure how well-funded they are, but they are uh, attempting to build out a scalable house call platform like we are. They're, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to sound um, arrogant or, or, or bad talk them. They're a year or two behind us from right, a technology right. perspective. And, and they, they kind of remind me of what we were back in the day where it's sort of like, the, before we had built most of our platform, it was kind of like the Wizard of Oz man behind the curtain where we had a somewhat flashy website, but everything else was done manually behind the scenes. And that's where these other companies are. And, and we're, we're, our platform isn't perfect. It's not, it's not you know, doing everything auto, in an automated fashion, but we're slowly but surely automating the things that we were doing manually. And we continue to automate things that we're currently doing manually um, and, and you know, making the platform that much more scalable and hopefully that much better of an experience for both the clients and the vet. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you've seen this in other demand, you know, on-demand markets where there's two, three, maybe four companies that, you know, are all pursuing kind of the same thing. You know, they all raise funding, but, you know, it does seem like just one, maybe two of them are, you know, able to, you know, to last it out, I guess. And some, you know, maybe it's either they got there first or they had the most funding. You know, you've seen it in the food delivery space. I felt like there was eight or 10 companies doing it. Now there's just two or three, um, you know, certainly Uber and Lyft, I guess, are kind of the only two that are left on the, you know, the ride sharing. So... Um, you know, it sounds like you guys have a, a good head start on the competition. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, what, uh, you know, out of these investors, I guess it's, it's not traditional. You, you don't really have a, I, I usually ask the question, you know, what's the best advice you've gotten from any of your investors, but you know, you don't really have like a traditional VC, do you? No, no. And, and I, I, I think that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, when you get a, a big check from a real VC fund, you get somebody who's probably on your board and who probably spends X hours per day or per week worrying about you. Right. Um, YC has stepped in, and we get a lot of help from YC. YC partners are amazing. Oh, but it, it, you know, it wouldn't be, or, or it might be annoying at times, but I think it would ultimately really benefit the business if we had a, uh, a real professional investor who was on our board and you know, personally and professionally invested in, um, in, in our success. And, and I, that is, you know, for... Uh, for reasons we've already discussed, it's something we haven't been able to get, but but that that would really be something that that I think would benefit us in any business. I mean, that hopefully that happens next. You know, you guys are with this recent funding from the crowdfunding, you're able to you know hit some of the the metrics or get the traction that you need to then go to a VC firm, and you know maybe that next round is a more traditional like Series A round from a VC. Yeah, yeah. Knock on wood. What does uh, what does your typical day look like nowadays? Yeah, it's, uh, so I have two small children, so that that obviously um, impacts my schedule a little bit. Uh, morning time and or, or or breakfast time and and dinner bedtime are usually occupied with with them. Um, but the day is is a combination of you know there's always some some fires to put out and some operational uh, crap to deal with, and then hopefully we can also spend some time worrying about stuff farther down the road. Uh, like right now, we're we're revving our app as well as 
launching a new version of the website. So that's that's occupying a lot of my time, and you know, even doing things like writing out wireframes, which is a lot of fun. You know, really really staying keeping your hands dirty with the product and and the tech. Um, we're expanding geographically, so a lot of time is spent uh, talking to prospects as well as bringing our, our current vets up to speed and, and making sure they understand how our how our system and our platform works. Um, but it, it uh, you know varies. It was a few months ago when we were we were raising the money. It was very much a, a fundraising uh, focus and, and doing everything that 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 involves. Just out of curiosity, when you guys were doing fundraising, how much time per week do you think you were spending on it? Oh, when we were trying to raise through tradition, traditional channels, it was probably 25 to 50 percent of my time. Wow. Um, thankfully, and I'm going to sound like an ad for WeFunder, but <laughs> WeFunder really takes care of a lot of the of the BS. Uh, they they set up our page for us. They obviously are you know doing a lot of the outreach. Although we we did you know ping all of our clients and, and all of our email lists about the round. Uh, but but yeah, we I can't say enough good, great things. We funders they're they're really good people. They've got a, they've got a good network, and they seem to be um, in a pretty clear lead in, in that race right now uh, on the on the equity crowdfunding side. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. They're definitely one of the more respected platforms out there. So if somebody wants to do equity crowdfunding, I would I would certainly recommend WeFunder as well. Uh, what is your favorite uh, third party piece of software that you know you or your team uses on a daily basis that you know you couldn't do without? Mm, good question. Um, we haven't used it a lot lately, uh, but when we were using it, it's just it's so cool. Optimizely uh, for yep. for the the, the AB test. I was we, we were constantly surprised by how how impressive their platform is. We recently stumbled upon uh, Webflow, which is a, a YC company who does kind of like I guess it's a content management system, but it, but it, it it does quite a bit more and really lets you. Uh, manage your site uh, in, in a very, and also multiple sites. We're going to start building sites for for other veterinarians that aren't necessarily that pronto branded. So Webflow makes that uh, super super easy, and, and we haven't really started using their their service in anger yet. But that that's been kind of the the latest shiny object that that's been put in front of us, and it seems pretty pretty slick. You want to just tell the audience what uh, Optimizely does? Yeah, Optimizely does God, so, so many things. Some people use it for their content management system, which is which is crazy because they're probably spending way more than they should, but primarily let you let you set up split tests for uh, for for your site. So, for example, you can have a you know using a, a contrived example for us. Maybe we want to put a picture of a cat or a picture of a dog up on our homepage and see which one uh, converts into more appointments. So, Optimizely makes it super super easy to to set up those two those two versions of your site and then see the results. And you can do you can do so. That's a very simplistic example, but it's basically. Oh, that's a good example. Yeah. And then from there, you're able to determine right which which images or which text combinations you know convert the best for you, and obviously that's the one that you want to go with. Um, but it's amazing how many companies you know have that have landing pages don't really do any A/B testing or they don't optimize those pages uh, you know for the best conversion rates. Um, What's been your biggest surprise, you know, since you started the company two years ago? Hmm. And maybe, maybe it's how hard it was, how hard it is to fundraise. Yeah, yeah, that, that uh, well, it, it's, it's always hard to fundraise. There's, there's no such thing as easy money out there. No, and, and uh, but that, that doesn't answer your question. Um, biggest surprise, learning a lot about, about pet owner psychology. Um, we're we're commonly told, and, and we all know this, the, a, a crazy family member or friend who who um, who's, who's spent you know tens of thousands of dollars on their pet. Um, the truth is, most pet owners are pretty pragmatic with their with their pet care, unlike they are, say, with their children or with themselves. Um, fortunately, a lot of our clients don't fall into this category, but um, but but many pet owners treat their pets more like their cars than their children in that you know, they quote unquote love them. They derive a lot of utility from them, but they generally only take them in when they're broken. Right. And, you know, very depressingly, if repair fees go above a certain amount, they'll oftentimes replace instead of, instead of repair. Yeah. I mean, that, that it is hard. I mean, I've seen people have to put their pets down because the surgeries were going to cost them 
thousands and thousands of dollars and they just couldn't afford to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, would, pet insurance is out there though. I was Sadly, just, only 2% of, of say, pet owners buy yeah. it. Yeah. Um, is that one of these like ancillary, you know, revenue channels, like an affiliate channel that you guys can set up with pet insurance? No, it's actually illegal for veterinarians to recommend uh, an insurance company, um, okay. and it's a it's a tough business. Not not only two percent of pet owners in the U.S. Uh, have pet insurance. How does pet insurance even work? I mean, you obviously pay some sort of a, an annual premium, but then there's probably deductible, and it covers up to a certain amount. You know, just like regular health insurance. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Pretty much like it works like like uh, like human health insurance. The main difference, though, and, and fortunately for us, is that the the health providers do not interact with the insurance company at all. Uh, so we we get payment from the client, and then the client requests reimbursement from their insurance company. Oh, that's unlike perfect. human health, where there's the you no know. right because dealing with insurance companies is not fun at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we have friends that are doing human health, a human house call. Uh, services and, and yeah, the insurance is the, is the bane of their existence. Yeah, that's brutal. Um, if you could be mentored by anybody, who would it be? Hmm. Well, there's the, you know, some of the obvious names. Uh, you know, people who have set up very big, successful on-demand companies like you know Travis at Uber or uh, um, yeah, some of the interesting. I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the people we've been mentored. Uh, by so far, the, the guys at YC like Dalton and and PB are great. You know, Sam is is a genius. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have too many too many complaints, uh, but then I don't know what I don't know. So it's, right, yeah. I mean, once once you're part of the YC family, I mean, that's a huge bonus to any entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, they're great. They're great. I can't say enough good things about YC. And then t- t- one last, two last questions, I guess. What is uh, what is one of your personal goals over the next year that you'd like to accomplish? Personally, uh, I've been trying to do, and this is really not that much to do with the business, but uh, oh, I've been getting into meditation. Cool. Meditation, trying, trying to be more, yeah, trying to be more, more mindful. Of actually, the during our last round of fundraising, I, I felt the stress was was becoming unhealthy, um, and uh, it was actually having some health uh, consequences. And um, surprisingly to me, meditation ended up. Really, I'm not sure meditation was was the the cause or correlated with with the health issues going away. But but it, it, it there there is a lot going on in your head, and um, and trying to get more more mindful and and having a little bit of 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 you know, time when you can just you know reflect. I think is is incredibly valuable and maybe not as valuable as as many of us. Think. This might be a silly question, but how do you learn how to meditate? I mean, do you watch? A video? Do you read a book? Do you go to an expert? <laughs> so there's an app for that. Uh, I'm, I'm using one of, of these one is. of these mobile apps that that helps you with with meditation. I'm sure there are better, more effective ways to do it. But um, I, I spend 10 minutes a day. Although now I haven't done my my meditation yet today. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really it's really nice. And there are some. It's not just that 10 minutes, but it also gives you ways to think about the rest of the day and you know, things like getting getting to sleep and exercising and whatnot. So it it is a it's, it's a pretty great thing. I happen to use. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not a fully affiliated with the company, but I use the uh, the Headspace app. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Yeah, I mean, there's there's an app for everything nowadays, and I, I agree. Stress as an entrepreneur can really beat you up. Um, you know, just disturb your health, disturb your sleep. You know, as we've all seen, certainly with two little kids. Um, you know, you got a lot on your plate. So, you know, congrats for, for getting this far with your company and your family. Uh, one last question. What's your favorite TV show? Right now, I think Westworld, uh, but that's only because it's, it's the one that we're, uh, that we're watching and it's still going uh, all time. Obviously the wire is amazing. Breaking bad is amazing. Uh, I've never seen the wire. I've seen breaking bad twice and I thought about actually doing it a third time. So totally agree. I don't, making, I don't like making meth, meth or but... watching the show. <laughs> uh watching the show i haven't uh haven't set up my cooking facility yet in my house but uh maybe, maybe after watching breaking bad one more time i'll get into it because apparently there's a lot of money in it jesus um well that's all i got for too, but yeah <laughs> I, i've heard the wire is good i do want to check out the wire so i'm glad you uh reminded me do, um, do. any last piece of advice you'd like to share with the audience you know whether they're uh currently running a company or looking to start a company something that you can tell them that you've learned to you know during your journey 
Oh, just just the um, and this is you know, pretty obvious to to anybody who's at an early stage company like ours. Just that that don't don't be afraid to keep keep getting your hands dirty. That this this there's this allure to you know always step away and, and focus on bigger picture issues and strategic and scaling things out, but really staying in the you know in the mess for uh, as much as possible. For example. All of, all of us, the co-founders, we all are on the phones every week, actually just, just answering client phone calls to, to book appointments or ask questions. And, and I, I suspect it will be that way forever. Uh, we, we, we don't want to uh, get so separated from our, from our clients that we're not talking to them every day or at least every week. Yeah, there's a lot of customer service, I guess, especially when it comes to pets. You know, people want to make sure that their pets are in good hands. Definitely, definitely. Cool, man. Well, thank you so much. Uh, what's the best way for people to find you online? You know, is there a, is it Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, AngelList? Uh, Twitter, Twitter, and 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 Facebook are uh, are, are both good. I'm I'm uh, I'm on there. My, my if anyone wants to email me, my email is just Joe at betpronto dot com. I'm more than happy to 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 chat or, or trade emails. Okay, I'll put all that in the show notes, uh, along obviously with the uh, the links to your website, the links to your mobile apps. Um, I know you guys are on uh, iOS because I've seen the app. Um, are you guys on Google Play too? Yep, iOS and Android, yeah. Cool. Um, awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for being a guest, man. Really appreciate it. Uh, best of luck with Vet Pronto. Excited that uh, you know this service may be coming to a, a city near you. Um, any uh, what cities are next? What cities are next for you guys? Are you guys gonna um, you know stick with the the ten or so locations you have right now and go with those for a while? We're slowly expanding. We've got we've got a few more cities that we're looking at. Maybe uh, Philadelphia, the rest of California. Austin. Um, we want to get out into the Austin. The, the yeah, we we have, we had trouble finding a vet in Austin, but but we've talked to a couple. Uh, rest in New York. Yeah, I mean, there's there's there there are there's so much more to do. Cool. But yeah, well, we'll go to Austin. You'll be the first one to know. It's a huge market. You know, you got 150 million plus pet owners out there, and uh, now they can do pet care on demand. Indeed. Thanks, so, man. Good so talking. Much, man. Fun. Yeah, absolutely. We'll stay, we'll stay in touch and uh, feel free to come back anytime. All righty. Bye-bye. Take care, Joe.